Uh, for, for unit introduction, this, this unit really is about transportation management systems. That's module three in the E-primer and traffic operations, which is module four. You will see that basically, um, as described in the E-primer, uh, TMS, transportation management systems, is more about the technology and the systems, whereas traffic operations is more focusing on what they do, what DOTs do with these systems. Um, but there is certainly some overlap between these two modules. Um, these areas, quite frankly, are, many, are considered by most to kind of be the bread and butter of ITS. These are the systems that we have the most experience with. These are the systems that the public sector has put you know, quite a bit of investment into. And at this day and age, you will find you know, transportation management systems guiding traffic operations in most major metropolitan areas. So it's a pretty standard type of system you see these days. Uh, things you learned in, for example, the traffic operations uh, 5400 class certainly apply to this. So this, this you know, is a little bit more on the technology and the concepts, um, but that's, that's the basic idea. I'm going to take a couple minutes here just to introduce it to you with an example. Um, this is from the Utah Traffic Operations Center, and I'm using this quite frankly because I was just out there for a meeting uh, two weeks ago at their operations center and in the field. I just wanted to show you some of the, the photos I took to just to try to show you kind of from a more uh, practical perspective what these systems look like. So let's go ahead and dive in. Um, you can, and I do encourage you to do this, go to their website which is u.traffic.utah.gov. That will give you access to the, the cameras um, the data that they collect, their uh, Twitter feed, all this, all the stuff that they're doing basically to push out to the public um, from their traffic operations center. So that'll kind of give you the public facing view of the system. So let's look at a few photos. This is actually, you know, it's one thing I think is interesting and important is uh, on the signal system side, we have a lot of experience and uh, there's, it's important to understand the equipment that you'll find out in the field. This is a pretty standard traffic signal cabinet. Um, this is the, the UDOT uh, uh, cabinet. You know, you'll see some differences around the country. I mean, there are some, some cities that are using incredibly old equipment that are still electromechanical systems. Um, but this is more of a modern digital signal system cabinet you'll find in most places, including almost every intersection in Virginia. Um, so just to quickly show you a few of the, the, the components, and these are these big metal boxes you see at every signalized intersection. Um, for this, so you have a controller here. Um, this is really the computer or the brains behind the system. So this is where you uh, deal with the signal timing plans. Um, as you get more into advanced technology, we're using these controllers to help interface, say, with connected vehicles and to push out signal phase and timing data. So this is kind of the key brains of the signal system. Uh, we have a conflict monitor. This is important because this is a physical, you know, monitor that will not allow signals to be in conflicting states. So when we talk about things like cybersecurity, this is important because you cannot, from a purely cyber perspective, um, put a signal into a um, conflicting mode. So uh, this is something I think that was done many years ago before we were ever worried about cybersecurity, but quite frankly it's important from that perspective. Um, some of these are, are relays. Uh, power relays, getting your know, load switches here. These are the actual load switches that change the signals from red, yellow to green. So um, let's see. Some of some of these are flashers. Uh, this is where you connect your loop detector or your again your vehicle detector um, content coming back. And, and again, what you see in the in the module or the modules, loop detectors are simply vehicle detectors that let the, the system know if there's a vehicle present or not. Um, we you can, sometimes we'll have ped detectors for um, for pedestrian calls for service, uh, and then this is where a lot of time the detector cards are actually uh, often located. So, again, these are secured. These do have uh, on and off switches to go to a manual mode that, for example, a law enforcement officer might use. Um, and some and uh, they are typically mounted in concrete next to the intersection. Um, just this equipment alone is probably on the order of hmm, 
probably a hundred thousand dollars something like that so this is not an uh, uh, inexpensive proposition so looking at this this is, this is actually one of the cabinets that we looked at um, for the per trip that I was in Utah for where we're looking at using connected vehicles uh, technology to do what's called broadcasting SPAT SPAT is short for signal phase and timing data and basically what we're doing here is pulling that data out of the system pushing it out via the dedicated short-range communications DSRC radios that vehicles can can uh, pick up and they will then know you know how long to the green how long do they have um, remaining in the green and that can support things like eco driving etc but again same sort of idea your signal controller these are your your load switches to uh, to, 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 to change your signals from red green to ye red, yellow to green um, some of your interfaces to the the newer technology the DSRC radios are up here um, but this is again a good, good example of a cabinet and hopefully this gives you a little bit of a s scale um, feel uh, this is an example of the DSRC radio mounted to the signal mast this is what's pumping out the SPAT data and other um, data for uh, connected vehicles so um, what they were doing in Utah was testing this technology Again, and the whole idea of this, which you, um, is just barely touched on these modules, is to better link um, the infrastructure to the vehicles. While in Utah, we also went to their traffic operations center. This is where people work to monitor the conditions and then to use the technology at their disposal to try to better manage traffic. Um, this is a, you know, just a, this is a middle of the day, I think on a Thursday, and you see here these video cameras, they can configure based on what's going on, and there actually had been a pretty, pretty serious crash, which you see in this video up here at this location, resulting in quite a backup on many of the uh, facilities. So they were trying to get the word out about this and, and manage traffic. Um, this man here was managing the signal systems to try to, to, to add capacity to parallel signals arterials to these freeways um, I'm not sure what these other controllers here are doing uh, this is simply I think a security monitor for the parking lot but there is quite a reliance on the video data um, they also then use things like signal systems ramp metering etc to try to manage traffic um, another this is a better picture of one of the controller stations and again it's, it's sort of a mission control kind of place where they have access to the data and can take action finally uh, one of the things that was interesting with UDOT's system is they have a person dedicated to public information and one of the things that they were doing was was tweeting out conditions continuously so people would know what was going on so for example here is the um, the uh, tweet about the crash that we were looking at a moment ago on the video. So again, I just I'm showing these pictures just to give you kind of more of a, uh, a real world perspective for transportation management systems, traffic operations in a, a, a larger urban area here in this country. Okay, let's now move to um, the case study, and that's right here. So this case study actually builds on the first case study that you did, looking at the concept of operations. And this is an important, really, first step in the systems engineering process. Um, and a concept of operations, quite frankly, is exactly as, it, as it's the term sounds. It's not a technical design. It's not detailed architecture. Rather, it's trying to basically state what this system is going to do, who is going to do it for, and what kind of world, quite frankly, that it's living in. So this is a you know an important step to to, to set the f the foundation for a good project. So this case study, you have access to all this information, the presentation, the take home exercise. I have taken this document, put it on the assignments section of Colab. Uh, you have a link to that here in this unit. I have assigned you to new teams to work on this one, so you will be able to build off your experience. But I want you to work with someone else for this project, and uh, I do have a little bit of a different. Uh, final deliverable that I'm asking for you to turn in at the end. I'll talk about that here in a second. So uh, again, I'm going to skip some slides in this presentation because there's repetition from Unit 1. Uh, the scenario is exactly the same as your previous case study for the National ITS Architecture. We're talking about traffic management for large planned events at a football stadium. Um, 
And in the exercise, you're going to identify the stakeholders, to describe the current situation, to define the justification for change, and develop concepts for the proposed system that include things like policies and constraints. Um, you'll find in this uh, on the the sheet or the, the the exercise sheet, they have actually gone ahead and entered in kind of sample solutions for all of these or sample responses. So, what I'm asking you to do is to go through this look at those samples, make sure they make sense to you, and then taking that information you can develop a, a, a draft first cut at a CONOPS for this. And I'm, I say CONOPS, the, the, the lingo that's used in this uh, industry for the concept of operations is the CONOPS, just short for that term. Okay, I'm going to skip these slides because we already know what ITS is, um, so we'll skip that. We'll skip the, you know, again, we know these address transportation needs. Here are some examples. Actually, this looks pretty similar to what I just showed you for the uh, Utah system. Um, this talks about the national ITS architecture, which again, you got experience using uh, last week in Unit 1. And talking about the system engineering process, which again, you read about in Module 2. Um, the sum is more than the, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Uh, that's a, perhaps a bit of a over dramatic slide, but it is true here. The idea of, of, of working with the architecture, of really putting a lot of effort into the systems design process is to make sure that you're really getting the synergy and the, the full benefit of the technologies that we're deploying in ITS. Again, back to the system engineering V process. What we're talking about right now is right at the beginning, the concept of operations. You need this before you can do anything else. And you will be shocked how often people want to skip this step and drive right down here to des design. They're excited. They maybe have funding. They want to get started. This stuff feels kind of slow and sluggish. Let's not do that. We know what we want. Let's go right to design. That is almost always going to lead to failure for uh, project development. And in, in fact, what I've found is that you know a go good, solid concept of operations pays huge dividends as you move through the process. Traceability is a term that I don't remember if you saw or not in Unit 1. The idea of traceability is basically to make sure that everything you do in a system can get traced back to the need in your concept of operations. So again, you're not doing things just because they're neat. You're doing things because you need them to achieve the goals you've defined for the project. Um, one of the key concepts here is that you want to push your technology decisions as close to implementation as possible. That is incredibly important in ITS. Um, if you think about it, technology, particularly information technology, is, is, is progressing at an amazingly rapid pace. And in many cases, if you try to design your technology too early, by the time you get through the design process, uh, bring on a contractor to develop your system and actually develop it, the technology you designed up front is actually too old to be of maximum utility when you actually design it. And I've been involved in projects early on in ITS where you know, the computer systems that were designed early in a project you couldn't even buy anymore because technology had changed so much in the course of say a year that you couldn't do that. So it's really important to, to stay general functional high level it is you know and early and then get to the detailed part very close to this the stage of implementation okay uh, so we're not gonna go too much into this but we're, we're gonna we're really trying to get to if the con ops is you know what are the design concepts what am I trying to do we're not talking about things like specs yet that's too that's we're too early for that um, this is uh, trying to get at the idea that you know you nothing you do anymore starts with a blank slate. Uh, everything is a system that's going to be tying into an existing system. It might be a legacy signal system, what have you. How do you develop your project to fit to what already exists? And that's what a lot of the ConOps talks about is understanding kind of the, the framework that you're working within to build your system. So again, this is where we are in our design system engineering process. Um, ConOps is something that is very much user-driven. 
Um, this is not something that has to be done from a technical perspective, but how are people going to use the system? Because that's what needs to drive design operations from that point forward. Um, I, this is just a silly slide. You probably have seen it before. Um, the idea here is that it's many times it's hard to communicate simple concepts and what you s describe is not what someone else often hears. But by formally documenting your concept of operations with all the stakeholders in a project, it helps you to come to agreement on the goals, objectives, expectations for the project, define the project scope and agree on it. Uh, as scope creeps and changes, you have big, big projects and big cost overruns in systems. Um, so basically all of these things you can come to agreement with by putting the time into developing a strong concept of operations. There are standards out there for EconOps. Um, one of the things that I gave you for this project is a guidance document for how to develop EconOps. And in fact, this is something that I did um, for Federal Highway Administration, gosh, like 12 years ago. So this is a, a guidance document that, that we wrote here at UVA. Um, hopefully that can be something to help you for the project. Now I'll, I'll show you here in a moment. Um, again, these are things I've already talked about. These are why we're doing EconOps. So again, user needs. We want to be able to define some scenarios for how the system will operate. That helps us to create a better design, know who the stakeholders are, etc. Um, I'm not going to read this to you now. Uh, I will, you, you can get access to these slides um, from the case study website. But again, this is just showing you for a scenario exactly how this AVL system, for example, automatic vehicle location system for this transit ITS application will function. And it shows you how this, this, this whole thing works, not from a technical point of view, but from an operational point of view. Um, this, I think, is pretty self-explanatory, but again, a user need is not, you know, oh, I like this cool technology, but rather it's what do I need functionally for me to better use, manage, run my system. Um, again, we can skip this slide, just kind of make the developer trying to be humorous. Um, so here are some user needs from the operational scenario we looked at earlier. So these are the things that help you develop well-written user needs. They have to be uniquely identifiable. They have to identify the major capability, which is again a functional capability. They uh, capture the rationale and they, they don't get into the technical how to meet the need. No, I'm sorry, those are some examples there. So now what you can do, and this is you see this in the exercises, once you start to understand that the, how the project, you start developing a very high level block diagram to fit the pieces together and how data will be exchanged. So you know, here's the person, the operator, here's the person's vehicle, and here's a system that's working to manage this bus and others. We're going to skip this one because this is a little bit off on a, a tangent. So the way you know that, that's recommended to develop a conops is again, you have to be aware of the constraints. Um, you have to understand the user needs. The conops is an iterative document. It won't be perfect to begin with, but it gives you a basically a, a, a tool to use to refine your understanding of a system. Um, and uh, you know they, these need to be revised after baseline version. So again, for this case study, I'm asking you to develop a first version of the CONOPS for this uh, stadium traffic management system. Um, it won't be perfect. Um, frankly, developing a really full, complete CONOPS is beyond the scope for this project for the class. So, you know, if there are certain things you think are too much, it's okay to make a note. This is this is not something we focus on this case study, um, because again, this is something that can take many, you know, many, 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 many 
hours beyond what I want you to spend on the project. Okay. Here's a recommended CONOPS outline. This is pretty good. Um, what you'll also see is for the, um, the guidance document that I've posted the link to for the project, uh, there's also a, an outline given there. You can use this one if you'd like, or you can use the one in, in, the, in the guidance document. I'll show you that in a moment as well. So again, I won't read these to you, but you can see, you know, first the document the scope. What reference documents did you use to develop this? You probably won't have too many of these for your case study. What is the current situation? You have a lot of that information in, in the exercise. Why are you doing this? What are the needs you're trying to address? Um, what is the basic concept? What are you going to try to do? Are there policies that need to be in place to make sure this is effective? Describe a few operational scenarios. This is something I would say, I'm sorry, this keeps moving on me. Um, the operational scenarios is, is really useful. Put yourself in the shoes of someone using the system, how it works. That helps you to think about the function it has to be able to support. Summary of impacts, uh, analysis of proposed system, appendices. Okay. So again, you don't develop a conops in a vacuum. For this case study, you know, obviously you don't have the stakeholders with you in, in the real world. You will work with them directly. Um, you, this, uh, one of the real values of this is it does give you a way to communicate well with the stakeholders. And uh, basically that's the, the idea here. So that is uh, the, the case study. Here's again the, the assignment. Um, this is what the assignment asks you to do. And again, I want you to walk through this again with their sample solutions and then move on to develop a draft conops. Okay. All right, so quickly I'll show you. Let's see here. Um, this is a document I was referring to developing and using a concept of operations and transportation management systems. Published way back in August of 2005 um, from a place called the University of Virginia. So uh, I remember doing this fondly. But this document does give you kind of a basic idea on how to do this. So you could take advantage of this for the for the um, for this particular case study. I'm trying to find here. The this one I really addressed a particular standard that was used for concept of operations. And I'm trying to find that here for you. This is it. Here on page 15. This is a, a standard approach to a CONOPS document. Again, the scope reference documents, operational descriptions, operational, operational needs, system overview, operational environment, support environment, operational scenarios. So again, you can use this outline, you can use the one that was in the presentation, I'm okay either way, but hopefully this document will at least give you some guidance on how to develop these pieces. Alright, so with that